I don't really know how to start this. It's my first one. At the time of writing this, I'm living in western Pennsylvania, a little south of Pittsburgh. I was in Boy Scouts for most of my life, so I feel very comfortable in the woods, and I often go camping. Upon hearing Governor Wolf's school closure plan, I decided that it was time for some cold weather camping. It was March. It wasn't that cold, but it did drop to 40 degrees at night, and the people who I went were not really avid campers. If you're from Pittsburgh, you may know the Boggs campsite on the Montour Trail. Well, that's where we went. They, of course, only brought weed and alcohol, did not bring any sleeping bags, blankets, or pillows. So, naturally, I assumed they were going to have sit by a fire all night. It was light when we first got there, and the fire pit was still smoldering. Very cool. We used the coals from the previous camper's fire to light ours. Immediately, I knew that I would have to provide wood for the fire until I went to bed. They passed out beers at around 3 p.m. The times are going to be a bit dodgy. I was not near my phone. After having two to three, I just honestly wanted dinner. Now that they did for me, they made ramen noodles and cheese, which was amazing, and burgers over the fire. By this time, it would have been close to 5 p.m. It began to rain just a little bit as was forecasted. So we took shelter in the lean-to shelter that was on site, and occasionally, one of them would throw some sticks on the fire. The sticks were all they seemed to be able to find, even though I brought two saws and an axe. I would cut up some logs. By the time the rain stopped, all four of us smoked and were sitting around the fire. I was light out, so we'll call it seven. After a while of just hanging around, they asked if I had any blankets. I always have blankets. Nothing special, but we've had some pretty bad snowstorms in the past, and a couple of scratchy car blankets are always useful. They each got a blanket, except for R, as we'll call him, who got my summer sleeping bag that I brought just in case. By now, it was dark, around 9 or 9.30 p.m., and the fire was getting low. I start off to find some more wood, because they wanted to smoke more. Now, it's important to know that I'm 6'5", and a semi-frequent user of weed, so my tolerance is pretty high. I return with the wood, and we spark up another one, a smaller one, just kind of hang out, talk, listen to music, Good times. Eventually the fire again dies down a little bit. And again, it's my job to get more wood. Because we had been there for a while, there were people there before us. Most of the wood near the shelter was either really small or all used up. So I had to keep going farther and farther away from camp to find wood. About 12.30 a.m., close to 50 degrees, so we're all doing well. I got a flashlight, a really nice one that I use for scuba diving. That is also kind of bright, so I use it on the low setting on land. At this point, I'm far enough away from camp that my friends cannot really see me, and there's like an embankment between the Montour Trail and someone's driveway that you have to cross to get to more woods. But I'm comfortable alone because I knew what I was doing, and they could hear if I needed them. I start to hear a weird whistling sound, kind of like somebody inhaling through a snorkel, but I believe it's just the wind. The air was starting to get kind of cold, so I took back what I had and put some on the fire. Now it's one to two in the morning, around 40 degrees with some light breeze, nothing severe. I have two long sleeve shirts and an army surplus coat that is super warm, but my friends are in windbreakers and hoodies, and oh yeah, now it's raining. Off to get more wood. This time, I began taking into consideration that the type of wood that I would collect, 
there was a lot of pine, but that burns fast, which is why I had to go and collect it so often. The stretch of woods near the driveway was pretty much all pine. A few maples, but nothing big. I keep walking, knowing that this area has both conifers and deciduous trees in close proximity to each other. As I'm wandering, collecting wood, I notice that the rain has turned to a super fine snow. Time to head back, just in case it picks up. Then the whistling started again, a lot louder now. It's weird. There isn't any more wind than there was before. Maybe it changed directions. I keep walking. By now, I can hear the music from camp and pick up the pace just a little bit. Just as I summit the embankment and prepare to clamber down the other side, a loud noise echoes behind me. A tree fell. Shining my flashlight around, I could not see a single sign that that was the case and did not see a source. Maybe a deer knocked something over. In my head it does not matter because I'm back at camp anyway and I could try the marsh behind our shelter next time. At three in the morning? They were cold. The temperature now dropped to around 30 degrees and the wind and snow had really picked up. Car blankets helped the boys a little bit but they were not going to be able to sleep in a tent that I brought. Not without freezing. Except for R, who slept like a rock all night, after about 3.30. We decided to finish off our smoke and beer, and a good talking. 4.30 a.m. I'm about ready for bed at this point. I'm not too inebriated at all, but I was definitely pretty tired. I offer to go collect more wood, before I retire to my zero-degree sleeping bag and cot. I camp comfy when I don't have to carry it far. They said they would join me. They must have been cold. We split up, and I end up heading back to where I was before. Except this time I left my flashlight on high, and I made a bunch of noise to scare off that deer, or whatever that was there earlier. I ended up a little further away from camp than I had intended because there were only pine branches on the ground. The whistling starts again. And this time, I could tell the direction it was coming from. My left. And I shine my flashlight around that area before just returning to collecting wood. And then the sound stops briefly, picks up again in a different direction, less than a minute later. This time in front of me, and a little to the right, back into the pines. Maybe the branches of certain trees catch the wind just right and make that noise. So, I think whatever and move on. Then, on my way back, the noise was following me, darting from left to right, but always sounding like right behind me. I didn't see anything, so whatever. Then the noise makes like one sharp whistle and pauses. Then I hear... It's cold out here. It was R, but I couldn't find him with my flashlight, so I called, Where are you at? And it sounded like he turned around, because I heard a branch snap and a bit of movement. I pointed my flashlight at where the sound was coming from, and I did not see R anywhere. Maybe he's behind a bush or a tree or something. I call out again. No reply. He might be lost or something, because we weren't at camp, and he saw my flashlight moving, so he came to look. I asked again, where are you? Nothing. And then louder. I'm going to go back to camp. I thought he was trying to scare me. Shining my flashlight around one last time, I spot something dive into a bush, about 40 feet from where I heard R turn around. I see you, big man. Grab some wood and come back. He's around six foot tall, about 250 pounds. I shine the light around for a few more seconds, then turn around again and start walking. The whistling is back. No matter what speed I moved at, it always seemed the same distance away. I decide that I just kind of sit under a tree and wait for R to pass by because 
He had to come back sometime. I saved battery of my flashlight, so I turned it off, closed one eye, so it would adjust faster. By now, the snow had picked up a really good bit, which is another good reason to stop, just in case R got lost. I couldn't really see far because there was a lot of cloud cover, despite being a full moon. The whistling never got closer, but it did start to move around a little bit, in a really odd circle. It would start in one spot, stop, then promptly start in another spot that was in a different direction. I realized that it had to be the wind or something, because it was moving way too fast, and moving at random. Cool. Now, where is R? I turn on my flashlight between whistles, and call out to his name again. It's important to note here that the whistling never picked up while I looked around. It normally only stopped for a second or two, and it was super quiet. The snow was laying on the ground, and we had two to three in on the ground by now, so maybe that muffled it. Anyway, upon not hearing R, I thought that maybe I missed him, or did not hear him at all, starting to head back to camp. As I stood up and brushed the dirt off my butt, I shined the flashlight around one more time, and I was thinking in my head. I definitely heard him. After I stood up with the wood in my arms and began to walk back towards camp, I saw something move out of the corner of my eye. My flashlight, being a diving light, has a wrist mount that I was wearing, so I could use it and carry things. I turned towards and scanned the area with my flashlight. Nothing. Not even four steps more, and I saw another movement. Now the whistling was back. It's annoying. It sounds like a fat guy who just ran up the stairs. Flashlight was on low, so I can only see maybe 40 feet around me. I didn't see anything, but I knew it was time to pick up the pace. The whistling was followed by flashes of movement, and I know it's not the wind. At this point, I'm speed walking. Being tall, I can move if I have to and I was definitely traveling at jogging speed. R, a lumbering beast when he runs, could not move this fast or quietly through the woods. Another thing that it's not. I decided then to turn off the flashlight, move into some brush that was close by. Not sure why, but I was getting a little weirded out. Had the shakes, even though I was warm. It was silent again. Well... Whatever this is, is it hunting me? Is it a coyote? Not a coyote. There was a good period of silence, then more whistling. And this time it wasn't circling around me, just moving around where I had turned off the flashlight. My eyes adjusted, and I peeked out from under the bush that I was rolled up under. Nothing. Just that whistling again. By this point, I was pretty much sober. Like if I got pulled over, I could nail the field sobriety test. I waited for a little while the thing just kind of looked around. Then I heard it speak. In a really gargled impression of me, it called out, Big man. It took everything I had not to panic. It's not R. It's not a human. Not a deer. Not the wind. Then it spoke again, saying R's name. Cutting off really strangely like you just lifted the needle off a record, but picking back up with Back to Camp. Still in a mimic version of my voice. My voice. I normally don't like hearing recordings of myself anyway, but now I really don't like them. It said a few more things in different voices that I did not recognize. All the voices were either talking about how cold it was, or questions like, What was that? Stop messing with me. But they all seemed like whoever was talking had some phlegm built up in their throat. Then it went quiet. I poked my head out of the bushes again, saw something sitting against a tree in the same position I had been in. Left leg straight out, right leg at an angle, hands behind my head. It could have fooled me as being R, 
we both kind of sit the same way, except his ADHD usually makes him fidget with his hands. Okay, so who's sitting in the woods with me? I lay there, silent. Just watch. It begins to whistle. So that's where it's coming from. It moves its hand around in a fist, out in front of it, the same way that I look around with my flashlight, then begins to stand up. And it's tall. I only weigh 166, skin and bone mostly. So when I say that this thing was skinny, don't take it lightly. I could see how thin its long spindly arms were silhouetted against the snow that coated a bush behind it. When it stood up, it was hunched over. Not sure if I was slouching when I stood up, but I certainly do slouch. It walked a few paces away from the tree and stood up the entire way. I worked with backdrops for theater productions, and the walls we use for most are around eight feet high, and this thing would have easily been able to see over one. I'm talking by at least by a foot. It slowly peers around, no hair on its head, and its side profile showed a super disfigured skull, the jaw hanging pretty far down, and there weren't really any lips that stuck out. But it was kind of hard to tell because of how dark it was. It let out one final R, big man, kind of like somebody with Tourette's would say, because they were just random and strung together. Then it let out this awful scream. My dad used to take me to air shows a lot as a kid, and this has been the same pitch and volume as an F-16. I couldn't move. It then peered down, around, head just seemingly sweeping the area. Then it crouches down again, leaps for a tree with the lowest branch, being around 15 feet, lands feet first on one of the branches, sits there, squatting, whistling, staring around, then disappears, faster than should be allowed in nature. I quickly count to ten in my head. The forest sleeps. I slowly make my way out from under the bush, begin to creep back towards camp, this time avoiding using my flashlight or making any noise if possible. I climb the embankment and take one last look towards the woods, unsure if that just happened or if I was asleep. I tumble down the other side of the embankment and return to relative safety of the big fire with Y and J and the other two who went for wood. They had asked me where's my wood. Oh, it had a it had bugs. It's fine. We got a lot anyway. They stacked up a solid pile of oak and pine. Not enough for the night, but enough for a little while. I asked where R was, and they pointed at the tent. He was passed out in there, snoring. I climbed into my sleeping bag, began to warm up a little bit. I was covered in snow, and then I heard that thing scream again off in the distance. Please don't tell me it's coming here. The other two looked at me wide-eyed. Normally, if I recognize a sound, I say what it is out loud, so they know what's up. To this, I had no response. They asked if I had heard the first one. Good. They heard it too. I answered with a nod as I unlocked the car in case we needed to book it. They asked if I saw it. I nodded. What was it? No clue. I described it to them quietly, so that I could listen for more noises, and told them about it imitating my voice. Y was now pretty freaked out, and Jay thought I was BSing him, said it was some kind of owl. I got out of my sleeping bag, threw my coat back on, and joined them at the fire. For the first time in a while, I looked at my phone. It was now almost six in the morning. We looked up native owl calls and came up empty-handed. The same happened with every other animal we tried. Jay did seem a little nervous. I suggested that maybe it's a truck on the highway. He agreed that that's probably what it was. They didn't sleep. I forced sleep upon myself so that we wouldn't die on the car ride home. The next morning we went for a walk. It did not snow much after I got back, 
so you can kind of follow my footprints. The tree, the thing leapt into, was out of reach of me on Jay's shoulders. R was still asleep, but I think I might have been able to reach it if I was on his. The tree I sat under had scratch marks on it. I think they're from deer shedding the velvet off their antlers, but it creeped me out nonetheless. The tree it sat under had footprints everywhere. There seemed to be no order to them. It was amazing. It looked like it had run over every square inch of that area, coming as close to the bush as I was in two meter lengths. I don't really know much about cryptids or anything, but when I got home, I googled North American Tall Skinny Cryptid, and the second result was from Parade. A list of cryptids, after ruling out everything else in the list, I came across a picture of the Wendigo that has antlers. Not quite, but pretty close as described. Tall and skinny and super fast. I did research. Every picture has antlers, but I can't find any evidence that, other than a few movies, it had antlers. I don't know. What I saw definitely didn't have antlers, but it matched everything else. Even down to the whistling. This was kind of long, but I'd appreciate any feedback. Thanks. The summer between junior year of high school and senior year, I had a lot of firsts, including my own account with what I believed to be a skinwalker. After talking to my grandmother, who's half-blooded Navajo, she believes that we've had something following our family ever since we left the res. I never had any experiences myself, not until that summer, where this thing would start appearing almost everywhere I go. It first happened when I was walking back from the store one evening, visiting a friend's house. I had gotten some candy and a pop, and was walking home, just minding my own business, listening, jamming out to Spotify, when I saw this strange tall coyote figure off in the distance on the hillside. I didn't really think much of it, and kind of just shrugged it off as maybe I'm seeing things in the evening light. But I looked again, and this figure, which appeared to look like a tall coyote, walking on two legs, coming toward me, but at a diagonal angle. This only caused me to walk faster. Now, I was a little freaked out, and I did not know exactly if this was a person in a costume or what I was going to be dealing with. As I picked up my pace, whatever this person or thing was, also picked up their pace. And before you know it, this thing was within 30 feet of me. So I stopped, looked directly at it, in hopes to make it stop. I know that sounds incredibly cheesy, but at 17 years of age, I had no idea what else to do. I knew running would probably only make it chase me even more. And it stopped, looked at me, and it was right at that point that I could see into its eyes. They were very dark, but the irises and the pupil were almost like a glowing ambery orange, very evil looking. The face looked very sunken down, very dark, and not in a color dark way, like there was something wrong with it. And for whatever reason, I believe that what I was looking at was completely from the demonic realm. It was kind of like half man, half coyote, except the head was entirely coyote, but the body and the legs were more man-like than anything else. I kind of just quickly looked down, paused my Spotify, and slowly backed away as this thing stood still and never took its eyes off me. I backpedaled and backpedaled until I could turn around and think to myself, I'm going to make a run for it and take a chance. If this thing follows me, I'm hoping I can outrun it. So I backpedaled some more, with this thing still staring me down, eyes on me like a dagger, and in one fluid motion, I turned around and sprinted faster than a high school track runner, all the way down the block, down a second block, down the next block, never looking back, and never hearing this thing following me. Once I'd made it several blocks, right to where near the store where I bought my candy and pop. 
I looked back. Didn't see anything. Didn't hear anything. I felt like I was safe. For the time being. So I walked home the long way, which took an extra 40 minutes from where I was at. Once I got home, I felt really uneasy the rest of the night. Like my entire night was just ruined. I was in a foul mood. Not just obvious distress, but something had disrupted me, emotionally, internally. I feel it was this point that I felt like I was marked. A couple of days go by, and I just get the feeling that maybe it's a good idea that I speak to my grandmother and tell her about what I had encountered a few days before. I knew how she was. She's what I would call very superstitious, even though she still believes in a lot of the native lore, and her beliefs very much so come from that area, I was still very worried that I would be met with conflict and a lot of doubt. But surprisingly, I just said, you know what, screw it. So I called her up, told her what had happened, and she asked that I come over immediately so she could bless me. While she wasn't anything special, like a medicine lady, she was good friends with one of the local medicine men from the res, who actually traveled over 300 miles to come to us to bless me. Well, I think that's great. We still had sightings and encounters the rest of that summer. One time, about a month later, I was spending time with my grandmother's house. At night time, we were outside, smoking cigarettes, joking around. This is in Southern California, far away from the reservation. I didn't think I had anything to worry about, but that was very wrong. And at the time, I didn't think anything of the lore or any of the beliefs of the Navajo. In fact, one of my good friends was actually a mix of Choctaw and Cherokee, and he thinks the entire thing is all baloney. Doesn't believe any of it. He's pretty much rooted in modern-day culture, though. So, the only roots to his native culture are his blood. I pretty much sided with him before all of this happened. But once I started having my encounters, I kind of switched to the other direction, as far as my beliefs go. Having first-hand accounts with something will definitely change the way you think and feel about anything in particular. So, anyway, we're out there, smoking cigarettes, joking around, and the sun's pretty much setting really low in the sky. We kind of just get lost in telling each other stories and talking about fun memories we have together. And before you know it, it's pretty much almost pitch dark out. My grandmother's inside, and she's probably wanting to know when my friend is going to leave so she can spend time with me. At one point or another, him or I were mid-sentence when we both felt this distinct change in the air and atmosphere around us. It was so noticeable that as soon as it happened, I felt the change on both of our faces, like our expressions had changed from normal to now, what's going on? We both instantly began looking around us, expecting somebody to be near. But it was so dark now that we couldn't see anything, and we did not have any flashlights, only our phones, and the flashlight app on our phone isn't all that bright. I mean, you could only see maybe five or seven feet in front of you. Whatever we felt wasn't good. We quickly wrapped up our conversation, threw our cigarettes down, and walked back into the house. Very quickly, he's like, hey man, I think I'm going to take off. And so, I didn't argue with him. I just wished him well on his way. So he heads out, and I start talking to my grandma. And maybe 30 seconds goes by, and I immediately remember. I needed to borrow 20 bucks from him. So I run outside, and remember, it's pretty dark out now. And I call to him, and I hear him call back to me. So I run up to him, and I'm like, Hey man, I forgot to ask you, from earlier, could I borrow that $20? And instantly, I feel this force come at both of us. It made us both jump, and we both take off running. The only way I know how to explain it is that it felt like something very evil coming right for us. And our bodies just reacted to the emotion and took off running in the same direction. We both ran and ran until we got to a couple streets down, where him and I are panting, not knowing exactly what was pursuing us. I knew right then and there. It's exactly what I saw a month ago. 
the same creature. So I tell him, forget trying to run away. Let's run in a big loop around the neighborhood and circle our way back to my grandmother's house because I'm sure at this point, she's probably wondering why I have not come back inside. So we do that and it takes us about 12 minutes, being very stealthy, very careful, but we could still feel a change, a very distinctive change in the atmosphere. It's incredibly creepy. We make our way back to the house, praying that this thing did not follow us. We get inside, and my grandmother immediately notices both our faces are pale white, and we look scared out of our minds. She knows, and immediately calls her friend, the medicine man, and says that she knows what happened. We need to be blessed immediately. Yeah, that summer was a wild one. And since then, I try not to mess around too much with things I don't know too much about. There were other small incidents here and there, but those were the main two that were actually worth writing about. And the fact that the second time, I feel like whatever this thing was, assuming it is a skinwalker, wanted to attack me, potentially kill me. Why it had targeted me and my family, I'm not too sure. I also don't know too much about my family's history on my mother's side, which is my grandmother, who's half Navajo, and her side, which, if you keep going up the family tree, is all full-blooded Navajo. Maybe the family on her side did something, and this thing has been tracking us down ever since. This is all just guessing, of course, because I really don't know, and I have not asked my grandmother. But, you know, even as I write this, maybe it's time I do. I'm scared writing this. We were checking on an escaped rooster in the woods that has backed our house. We took a very shanty flashlight, spotted him quite easily. Something about these woods just aren't right. They feel off, and I had a terrifying encounter with something in them that to this day is both unexplained and witnessed by the police. My neighbor and my girlfriend. But that's a story for another day. Anyway, we were walking back after successfully locating our escaped rooster, perched in the distance on a tree branch just beyond the wood line. This is when we both noticed a gray mist like thing in the sky, almost like an owl. The problem is we both witnessed it vanish into thin air. We went inside for a moment to check on our daughter, and when we went back out to figure out what that was, we found nothing, or so we thought. The house next door built a shed with a motion detection light in their front lawn. We were standing in our front lawn, looking into the trees with a better flashlight, expecting to see an owl. Instead of the motion light kicks on, and we see a dog. Sorta. It was something on four legs, and it ran into the distance, only looking back a few times. Problem with this is the dog would have had to have been standing still for at least ten minutes to not re-trigger the motion light, as it stays on after being activated for ten minutes. It's like the dog appeared out of thin air in front of the motion light. The strangest part that it appeared right where we say the misty air creature disappears. What are your thoughts? I'm terrified. Could this be a skinwalker, a shapeshifter, or something else completely unnatural? This happened to me in the mid-1990s. I was stationed at Camp Pendleton, California, and had duty one evening. Part of the duty shift is to go around and check that certain doors and buildings were securely locked. At about three in the morning, I was out doing my rounds, and I saw what I thought was a big coyote in the road. Seeing a coyote in that area would be unusual, but not impossible. As I was watching it, and it watching me, it stood up on hind legs, walked out of sight between a couple of buildings. At this point, I was alarmed. 
but I figured I was hallucinating, since I'd been awake for something like 24 hours. Wouldn't be the first time my tired eyes and brain had played tricks on me. Later on that morning, one of my fellow marines, I'll call him H, asked me how my duty was. One thing to understand is that the marines seem to have a relatively large number of Native Americans. It may have something to do with the pride of code talkers from World War II. And I've had one friend, H, say he joined the marines because he could not find a warrior job anywhere else. We were infantrymen. At any rate, H was Navajo. I had known him for years, even spent a couple of weekends at his family's place near Gallup. I told him about my hallucination. He got quiet and said, that's, I'll call him B, another Marine in my company, also Navajo, but I did not know him nearly as well as I knew H. He's a bad guy. I'd stay away from him. Now, it's always been difficult to tell if H was joking. He was a man of very few words and fewer jokes, but he seemed very serious. I told him to quit messing with me. He responded by telling me that B was a skinwalker. I had never heard that term. That came from a family of skinwalkers, and that they were like bad witch doctors. At that point, I didn't know what to believe. So I dropped it. I can say that every time I came across B after that point, he just stared at me. I gave him a wide berth from then on. He had some other odd experiences in the American Southwest Desert, as well as what was probably a djinn, and when I was embedded with Iraqi troops years later, we could see a man walking around in the darkness, but nothing with thermal or IR sights. But... That was by far the strangest, and the only time I ever came in contact with anything remotely skinwalker-related. So, I grew up being exposed to Bigfoot, although it took years until I realized what I was actually dealing with. My family is very aware that they live on my father's property. My sister, who also lives in the country thought she too had a Bigfoot, because they would always hear children giggling outside. But there's nobody there. When I visit her home, I live in Canada, she lives in Ohio, I always feel uncomfortable, and I'm able to sense that there is indeed something there. I've never really mentioned it because I didn't want to scare her, my nephew. I knew something was looking in the windows at me at night, but I thought it was their Bigfoot, despite it feeling different. Well, now I'm convinced we are not dealing with Bigfoot. Recently, my sister has been hearing things outside, like clicking, stuff to get her attention when she is smoking on the steps to her house. She thought a coyote had approached her in the night, but she said something wasn't right about it. All she could see were the eyes. She only hoped it was a coyote. Two days ago, she said that something was whistling at her, and she was scared. Then, last night, she called me, panicked, saying she had heard kittens meowing in distress. She is a cat lover, after all. And to me, it's trying to lure my sister out, and it knows she loves cats. She said that none of her animals would go outside with her last night. Her dog is attached to her hip, so the fact that he did not want to go out there was a red flag. At first, I thought it was a wendigo, so I began doing research. Obviously, my understanding of what those were was wrong. So, now I'm here, looking for advice on how to get rid of whatever this is, be it a skinwalker or a flesh gate. I knew there was something wrong with that land. And to give a little backstory, in my teens, I live in a small town in Oregon and on property surrounded by a forest that's really not that dense. 
I have a few neighbors that are not close, but still within yelling distance. Last night, I was told to go close the gate. It's about 150 feet away from my house. I don't like going outside at night. People at our house, not just my family, have occasionally heard someone calling to them, trying to lure them into the dark areas of our property and out of view of our four cameras. They only cover the area around the entrances, which I have had happen to me once. I asked my mom if I can ask my dad to go with me to shut the gate. She said yes, then she got mad at my dad for agreeing, even though she said I could ask him. She called me immature, ended up running really fast to close the gate. On to the actual story. I decided to talk to my friend about how my mom got mad about my dad, willing to go out with me to shut the gate. The conversation drifted to why I don't like to go outside and tell him about the four encounters, including mine, about something mimicking somebody's voice, luring them into the darkness. He does not believe in things like that, and I go to sleep, wake up like normal, and I get to talking about what I was telling my friends to my older sister, and how we needed more cameras, since they aren't capturing this thing. Can you guess what she tells me? Last night, while my mother was smoking, she heard my older sister calling to her from the darkest part of our property and the biggest blind spot of our four cameras, all trying to lure her away into the darkness. Also, this has happened to my older sister twice, along with hearing heavy footsteps on the roof at nighttime. She doesn't like going out at night anymore. Not any more than I do. Now, she knows why I don't like going outside at night. I'm not just being immature. I think it might be a skinwalker. But someone with more knowledge please shed some light about what kind of creature this could be. My dad has night vision binoculars that can take pictures and record video. But sadly, no audio. I'm hoping these will come in handy. I'm going to ask my parents if they're willing to add at least one more camera in the blind spot, since that small area is where three out of the five events happened. As I noticed, it likes to stay away from our night vision cameras. I also asked my mother about it. She said that it happens a lot. She goes out in the middle of the night to smoke, and that huge light illuminates most of it sometimes when she goes out. This is not normal. It shouldn't do that. The bulb was well over 15 years old when we replaced it a couple of months ago. Can skinwalkers shut off lights? I never knew that it happened at all, since I have never seen it, though I check the cameras frequently. My people are very different from the Navajo and Algonquin. I won't say we are similar, other than the big category we are thrown into. However, there's one thing that crosses from them to me. I'm not sure what exactly it is. I'm not going to ask you, but I'm going to share my experience. I'm a Seminole native from Florida. I was raised among one of the biggest res we have there. It is, however, very overgrown. It gives off a ghost town vibe. I lived by a bunch of people, so I wasn't very afraid of what goes bump in the night. I was probably around 15 when this happened. At this age, I was isolative, and only came out of my room when I called. That was it. Maybe I'd get food every now and then, but it wasn't often. So, I was sitting in my room, watching TV, and I heard my mom say, Take Gooch. That's my nickname. It means little girl. So I got up, and I walked out. Asked what she needed. She got confused, and irritated. Told me she did not call me. Made me go back into my room. This happened a bunch, ranging from my real name to my nickname. There was this time that I had sat with my mom, and remember her telling me to grab a Diet Coke. I thought it was weird, 
because I had just gotten her one a minute ago. But I got up, and got it regardless, handed it to her. She was confused. I also was confused. And we started arguing. She took it, but I began to question my mental health. That was until she heard it too. I remember. We were sleeping on the floor together and having a rare family night. My sister and I already fell asleep, but my mom was up. I don't know what happened. I woke up to her screaming for something to leave. Go! Get out of here! Leave us alone! I asked what had happened, but since she was already made, she told me to go back to sleep. I later found out that she had heard footsteps in the hallway, which scares the everlasting life out of me. I know this could be grouped with some other thing, like skinwalkers or wendigos, but according to lore, wendigos will call to you in the voice of people you love, and I believe someone was testing the waters. I used to work on Vandenberg in Central California. My office was on top of the mountain that was ceremonial Chumash land. Whenever ground was broken, we had to have a religious leader come out and bless the ground first. It's usually pretty foggy, about halfway up the mountain. I got used to driving it every day, but you have to keep an eye out for deer, mountain lions, bears, all sorts of wildlife. One night, around 11 p.m., I was driving down the mountain, had just gotten to the point that the fog was gone. In front of me, in the clear, behind was just a wall of fog. As I got to a sharp turn, I saw what I thought was a large coyote in the road. I quickly slammed on my brakes. It looked like it had no fur, and was covered in pale, leathery skin, with a dog-like head. As I looked at it, it rose up on its hind legs. It was hunched over, maybe six feet tall, but maybe seven feet tall, standing straight up. It turned and looked at me, slowly walked off the road, into the brush. At the time, I was doing a class about Native Americans for my degree. I was in touch with Chumash members for my project, so I asked them if they knew anything about it. They simply said, We don't talk about that. This day, I'm 100% certain I saw a skinwalker that night, What do you do if a skinwalker has seen you? I was traveling in the dark at work, tonight, and I'm on a military base, in a gated area, where it's pitch black, except a single light post, near the gate. I need to go outside to smoke. A wolf-like creature that was pitch black walked directly under the light, so I could see it fully. I thought, cool, looks like a fox because of its thick black tail. Then I realized it was around the size of a wolf, with really thin legs, a lot of hair hanging down its neck, and its tail was dragging about a foot behind it. It stopped and turned its head slowly towards me. All I saw was its shiny white eyes staring through me. I couldn't move until it looked away, and did a 180, went back into the shadows to where I could not see it. I slowly approached to go out of the gate, it had disappeared after I got outside. The gate locked. I lit my cigarette, started smoking, decided to turn on my phone's flashlight, scan the fence line where it had gone. The area it disappeared into was a lot shorter than I originally thought. The gate I went on only had about 20 feet before another gate cut the area off. The creature had disappeared so, while I was skinning slowly, I saw nothing. But I did hear a whistle that sounded like it had come from not far up directly in front of me, through the gate. I slowly backed up, got into my car. Was it a skinwalker? What does the whistling mean? Last I checked, there's no dog I know that's full black with long, dragging tails that whistle in the middle of the flight line on a military base. If anybody knows anything, please 
let me know. From 2010 through 2015, I was living out of a van. I would travel all over the country, staying in Walmart parking lots, friends, driveways, campsites, oftentimes just down some path in the woods that was wide enough to fit my vehicle. I have countless wild adventure stories from that five-year period, but I'll share with you one that really left a mark, both physically and mentally. For the last two years of my homeless stint, I had stuck to the east coast of the United States, slowly making my way north to New Hampshire and Maine in the warmer months, then heading slowly south as winter approached to avoid the blistering cold of the northern states and the eastern U.S. I had made friends and contacts from Florida to Maine and would stop for a week or two at certain locations to work, make some travel money, visit with people I knew along the way. One of the ways I would make money was with buying and selling antique guns. So, I would do my best to avoid certain states that were not gun-friendly, like Massachusetts, Maryland, and New Jersey, as I would usually have a gun or two with me and would always have a threat of being harassed by the local and state police and due to my lifestyle. The previous years while heading north, I decided to save time by breaking my travel rule by passing through New Jersey. I had made friends while camping in the backwoods of New Jersey. People known as Pineys, they call themselves that because they live in a little known but fairly vast forest in the southern half of the state, known as the Pine Barrens. These good folks took an instant liking to me and spent almost a week living at my campsite with me. They worked as roofers during the day and drank booze and raised hell at night. They were super friendly fiercely loyal and hardworking. In 2015, as I was heading south for central Florida, I made sure to swing by New Jersey again to hang with the Pineys, make a little cash roofing with them. So, I spent six 12-hour days roofing with my friends, stayed in my van, parked at my friends and the small farm in the Pine Barrens. On my seventh day, I decided that, after hearing endless tales about the wonders of the Pine Barrens from my piney friends all week, that I needed to go and explore the woods of southern New Jersey for a bit before heading south for the winter. I went online, found a campsite that allowed for vehicle camping, and was perfectly situated on the Molica River. It even had miles and miles of hiking trails. I kept a rather expensive folding mountain bike in my van was always looking for a chance to take it out and explore. Due to the very flat land, the Pine Barrens was the perfect place for that. I set up camp and was thrilled on the first night to be able to have a fire and enjoy the cool night air while losing myself in the dance of the flickering flames. I spent the next few days biking around the wilderness, fishing the river, and howling back and forth with the local coyotes at night. On the fourth night, things began getting weird. The coyotes that had kept me company each prior night were nowhere to be found, and I kept hearing a loud whistling every so often in the woods, just around my campsite. Just like a human whistle, except louder. Around midnight, I could hear somebody slowly circling me as I sat at my fire. It sounded just like a human, on two feet, trying to be quiet as they moved through the dead and dry leaves, just out of sight. I began to feel uneasy. Even though it was not allowed in New Jersey, I grabbed my snub-nosed 357 Magnum out of the van and kept it in my jacket pocket. When most people think of New Jersey, they think of a densely populated city or Jersey Shore beaches. But make no mistake, Southern New Jersey can be as backwoods and deliverance feeling as parts of Western Virginia. Although it was a little risky, I decided that it would be best to keep my 357 on me for the rest of my time there, just to be safe. The next day, I spent the area exploring on foot. 
I hiked for miles and came across what looked like a primitive campsite. It had two small shelters made from branches, twisted saplings all weaved together. Inside one of the shelters was a few items of old torn clothing, an old functioning boombox, and a few chrome pieces of car. The shelters were in no way weatherproof, as there was no way to keep the rain out of them. So, I was very confused as to why somebody would go to such elaborate lengths to build them. On the edge of the campsite clearing were multiple trees that had fallen over away from the campsite. Four medium-sized pine trees fallen in opposite directions from each other, roots sticking out of the sandy soil. That afternoon, after a long day of exploration, I made my way back to my van, had a big meal, and went to sit on a bed of perfect moss along the edge of the Mullica River. I sat there, watched the sunset. The sun was about to dip down behind the trees, and I was sitting there with my headphones on, listening and relaxing to music, waiting for the evening to slowly creep in. I was feeling so alive. Just then, a barnyard-type smell filled the air around me, and I felt the hair on the back of my neck stand straight up. A chill ran down my spine. I began to pivot to my right, look behind me, and the last thing I remember was something smashing into the whole right side of my head and face. Tremendous pain. Then a loud ringing. I was awakened by the stinging of a sharp tree branch scratching across the left side of my face. As I opened my eyes, I saw the ground beneath me moving, and my chin was bouncing off a solid hide with coarse hair as the earth moved below me. The pain in my head was almost unbearable. I fought to stay awake. These few seconds were very confusing. I opened my eyes again, started to look around, and saw two huge hairy legs below me, moving in stride. Then, I felt another almost unbearable pain as my ankles were compressed together, grinded against each other, while whatever was carrying me adjusted its grip around them, crushing them together. I realized all of a sudden that somebody was carrying me over their shoulder and moving quickly through the woods. I was in a state of shock. I was also in pain from my head to my feet, but a huge surge of adrenaline hit me all at once, and now I was wide awake. I was too afraid to start kicking and screaming and draw any attention to myself, so I went into a mental panic as I searched for an option in my head. Then it hit me. I remembered that I had my 357. It was in the small of my back in a leather holster with a snap button closure. My right arm was blocked by the creature head, so I reached behind myself with my left hand, quickly unsnapped the holster strap, struggled to free my gun as it was set up to be drawn by my right hand. And nevertheless, I managed to get it free, brought it in front of myself, thumb cocked the hammer, put the barrel right onto the hairy back, directly below me, and squeezed the trigger. The gun went off, sending a 158-grain lead-nosed bullet into the right side of my attacker's back at point-blank range. The creature let out a bellowing scream, dropped me right on top of my head. I rolled onto my right side and finally got a good look at what had been carrying me. It was no doubt a Bigfoot. There was no doubt at what I was looking at. I knew what it was the second I saw it, and have never been so terrified in my life. It was facing my direction while reaching its right hand behind itself and clawing at the hole I had put in its back, all while staring at me in disbelief. I still had the gun in my left hand, so I took aim at this monster again. When I pointed the gun, its expression changed from pure pain and disbelief to fear. I shot at it again, somewhere center mass as it was turning to run. 
It yelped, much like a dog does when it gets hurt. Tore off into the brush at an incredible speed. I could hear it crashing through the brush and trees, like a freight train, as it ran off in the distance. I stayed there on my side for a few seconds, with my left hand still pointing the gun and shaking wildly. I then thought to myself, what if it comes back? Instantly, I was overwhelmed with fear. I jumped to my feet, sprinted as fast as I could in the opposite direction that this thing had gone. I ran for only a few hundred yards before I knew where I was. It would seem that the Bigfoot had only gone a short distance before I had woken up. I ran to my campsite, started frantically throwing everything haphazardly into my van. I was sure that this thing was going to come back for revenge at any moment. I checked the cylinder of my five-shot revolver, quickly replaced the two spent shells with fresh rounds, then stomped on the gas and ripped out of there. After a few minutes of driving on the dirt roads, I finally came out to the pavement, and my fear began to subside. But at the same time, the pain in my head and face spiked to terrible levels, so I headed for the nearest hospital. When I got to the ER, I did not even consider what I was going to tell them happened to me. I looked like I was hit by a Mack truck. Felt like it too. I decided to tell them that I was attacked by somebody in the woods. This was a bad idea. They had had a police officer there within a few minutes to take a report. He could tell I was not telling the truth and kept pressing me to say what really happened. I stuck to my story, and he eventually left. Turns out I had suffered a bad concussion, as well as a torn eardrum in my right ear. The next day, my face swelled up so badly that my right eye was swollen shut, and my jaw hurt so badly that I couldn't even chew solid food for almost a week. I think that Bigfoot had smacked me hard, with his open hand upside my head. But I can't be sure. Needless to say, I never went camping in the Pine Barrens after that. I called my friends from that area, told them what had happened to me, and they confirmed that every so often, someone will encounter a Bigfoot creature like that in the woods, here, around where they live. Never again for me. Okay, so I would like to keep this somewhat discreet because my family still to this day use what I told them as a joke against me. I don't need everybody in my town talking about me because this just sounds ridiculous. This happened near Tom's River, New Jersey. Me and my buddy were on our way to a job in Browns Mills and were traveling down Route 70, which is known as the Pine Barrens. It was somewhere between 6 and 7 in the morning. About 7 deer came shooting out from the right side, going left across Route 70. I did not slam on brakes, because it was like 50 feet in front of us, but I stopped pretty fast. And I kid you not, there was a big hairy gray and brown thing that came running right up to about 3 feet from the pavement. It stopped and turned around and ran the other way, back into the woods. Since I seen this, I began watching that Finding Bigfoot show, but their videos and pictures are always something black. This thing was light gray and brown, and it was huge. I mean huge like eight foot tall. Big like fat big. It could not be a guy because it had hair all over its face. Like, I didn't even see its eyes or lips or nose. It was like hair for a face. We seen this thing at about 25, 35 feet. I know it was real, because my man was totally in sync with describing it to each other. It was all we talked about for the rest of the way to the job. It was like what I was thinking he was saying, and vice versa. This was just two months ago, and that was it. Hope this helps. I was a Boy Scout in the early 1970s on a camping trip. On a summer night, a friend and myself were out walking on a lone gravel road, tall pine trees on both sides. It was the Bass River State Forest. 
The moon was full, and we were getting ready to crest a hill when we smelled something really foul. I thought something was dead and nearby. I didn't really think too much of it. We crested the gravel hill when we heard gravel being kicked. Mind you, the only light we had was the moonlight. When we heard this, we stopped, and I was a little scared because I thought it might be some guy in the woods scoping us out. We were frozen for a few moments, as to not make any noise. Then, we both saw a silhouette of a very large thing. Whatever it was, we were able to make out that it was like a giant hairball running across the road. We were pretty scared at this point, looked at each other, and said, let's get out of here. My guess is that it was at least seven feet tall, with a very heavy stride. We both took off back to camp. When we got back, we told our scoutmaster, and all he did was laugh and say, yeah, sure, now get back to bed. I kind of avoided it out of my mind for years, always believing that something was there, and I just kept it to myself. Then I found the BFRO, and reading lots of stories on this area, I'm 37 now, and to this day, I still think about that night, and wonder to myself, was I dreaming that night or not? I don't think I was. Riding my bike through the woods with some friends, I had to stop to wait for them, when I heard a branch snap, no more than 40 feet away. It looked right at me, with large black eyes. It was roughly 8 to 9 feet. I got a good look too. I'll never forget. He was proportioned the same way a human being would. It was scary. With blackish brown rust colored hair. The hairs on his arm were roughly 3 to 4 inches long. His form was about the size round as my leg. About 20 inches around. His strides were long say 10 feet per step. He must have been watching me for something, because I stopped already a minute when I heard a branch snap. I glanced over. I was shocked, tried to figure out what I was looking at. He just stared. No noise, no motions, no gestures, no nothing. Very frightening, because you don't know what he is capable of. It was as if he was thinking of coming towards me, he was very close. I froze like a rock. I turned my head to see what my friends were doing, then turned back to look at him. He was still there. I know he got a good look at me too, because it looked like he stooped his head down slightly, peered hard at me. Then, he turned, raised his arms to gain his balance, and stepped into the woods. He didn't turn away from me, but rather walked to my left, his right, then I lost sight of him. I've told this story to many people, but I don't think anybody believes what I saw. I guess I, like, didn't believe it either, until I saw one with my very own eyes. It was at least 2 a.m. in January or February. The temperature was in the low teens. I was dropping off a friend at his home the back of which was separated from the highway, Route 72, by roughly 200 yards of woods and a dirt road. There are no homes or street lights on this part of Route 72. The east side is completely untouched woods, for miles, that goes into Burlington County. This area was the end of a development that had never been finished. Work stopped in the late 1970s, as a part of the Pinelands Preservation Act. There was a dirt road, about 30 yards behind the house, which connected to the east into a grid of unfinished, unpaved roads. At that time, his house was the last house on that road, completely surrounded by woods. We were talking beside the car, under the streetlight, for at least 20 minutes, when we both heard a woman screaming, it sounded like it was coming from the unpaved road behind his house. We both thought somebody was in trouble. So we ran inside his house, grabbed a flashlight, knife, and a hatchet. 
we ran into a trail along the right side of the house, southeast, which led out to the dirt road. We could hear the screams getting louder and more to our right, into the woods. We were only about 40 paces into the woods, when I began feeling very uneasy, and I began to realize that this wasn't a woman screaming. I could hear it now to my right, more like a loud whistling now, not ahead in the dirt road, like I had thought, about 15 yards away. We both stopped and listened for a few moments. My friend had the flashlight scanning the woods, which was new growth oak saplings, blueberry bushes waist high, and 12 feet to 14 feet, scrubby pine saplings, maybe 20 years old, if I'm guesstimating right. I could hear it heaving as it breathed in, exhaled out, with a very loud high-pitched whistling. We could not see anything, but it was very close to our right, as we faced southeast, within 10 yards. My friend immediately turned toward me and said, That ain't no girl screaming. Quickly moved past me, back toward the house. I was standing still, listening. It was still screaming right at us. At this point, I knew it was not a girl at all. More like a loud whistling is how I would best describe it. There was no other screams that night. There was no movement at all. No sound of struggle. I thought that it might be a wounded animal, like a deer or something. It was so loud, and the deep breathing noises were from a much bigger animal than a fox. In fact, I could distinctly hear it breathing in and out rapidly to make this screaming noise. I remember thinking that it's dangerous to be this close to a large, wounded animal. It was not anything like I had ever heard in my life. I turned and headed back, looking and listening. It was still screaming, but did not follow. We instantly called the police and reported it. Within 15 minutes, we went back outside. Now the screams were further toward the southeast. Very faint now. It had definitely moved off quickly. The screams faded totally within 10 minutes' time. We listened for at least another 45, but it was gone. I don't know what the police would have done after we'd called. I always just thought it was a wounded animal of some kind, but I guess I'm wrong. After reading the accounts posted, especially those from Ocean and Burlington counties, I knew that I also had a similar story. I had heard similar stories of a woman screaming in the woods and Manahawken from relatives who'd lived in the area since the early 1930s. They said it was accompanied by an awful smell and would come around at night during extremely hot or extremely cold seasons. They always expressed concerns that hunters would come and hurt or kill it, so it was a best-kept secret. I never believed them until I heard it for myself. Even after all these years, I still find it difficult to discuss what exactly I saw. I still vividly remember the encounter and how terrified my friend and I were afterwards. It's amazing how time slows down during intense moments. Every detail burned to my memory. But in actuality, only several seconds passed. To be honest, I don't know exactly what I saw that summer evening long ago. As a child growing up, we were taught in school the legends surrounding the Jersey Devil and weird happenings in the Pine Barrens. Hopefully this story won't be viewed as lore that the region is famous for. The only thing I can say for sure is it really did happen and I will do my best to portray the event as I remember it. I grew up in a middle-sized town, a few miles from both the Jersey Shore and the edges of the Pine Barrens. My neighborhood and town were undergoing a growth spurt, and wooded areas where I played as a kid were now strip malls or homes. My house was on a corner lot, and the neighbor's house directly in front was a summer cottage. They were not there at the time, I was 18 in 1989 and recently graduated from high school 
with a strict midnight curfew. My friend dropped me off at the time with the passenger side of the car facing the front of my house. I was outside of the car talking to Scott through the passenger side window. That's when we both heard a rustling sound near the trees on the corner of my neighbor's property, about 30 feet away. There was a street light on the opposite corner, and I could not make anything out beyond it. We did not think much of it, and continued to talk. The rustling returned a little louder, and with a sound that I remember as something being dragged on concrete, such as a stick. At this point, I asked Scott if he saw anything over there. At first, his reply was no. Then he hesitated, said he sees something like a big dog that is sitting by the trees. Not wanting to be bit by some rabid dog, I got in the car. We went up the road and turned the car around on the opposite intersection. Once around, we were facing my house, and there was what appeared to be a large grayish dog directly under the street lamp. We began moving very slowly toward my house. As we got closer, it really did not appear to be like any dog I had ever seen before. When we were roughly 50 feet away, I turned to Scott, asked him to turn on the high beams. It is here where things happen very quickly, and I will try and capture it as best as I can. To our horror, what we thought was a large dog stood up, and began to run on two legs. It crossed the car and ran on an angle at first toward the middle of my house, but then quickly changed course and went around the dark side of my house. We're both yelling, What is that? What was that? repeatedly. The creature was very tall. His head was taller than the top of the windows on the house, so I'm estimating around eight feet. He appeared to be light gray in color, but it could have been the lights reflecting off his hair. His arms were long and lanky, sort of swayed forward as if he ran. He had amazing speed and agility, and ran with one would consider to be an odd gait. His head was tilted forward, and he might have been slightly hunched over. His head swayed between looking forward and looking at us. I will never forget the way his eyes reflected in the headlights. The total time we had eyes on the creature was around five seconds. Once he disappeared, the car accelerated around the corner, and Scott slammed on the brakes, expecting to see the creature in the headlights. There was nothing but dark road. He was gone. Not wanting to get out of the car, we proceeded to Scott's house, just a few miles away. After a quick phone conversation with my parents, they demanded that I come home. They were waiting out front when we got there. We tried to explain what we saw. My parents would hear none of our tale and assumed we were either drunk or on drugs. We were both rather shaken by the event. My parents began to question their original assessment. Over time came the inevitable ridicule of family, friends, and alike and their mocking, I never really wanted to discuss with this anyone again. It took years before I was comfortable being alone, even at night. After spending time in the military, I came to the realization that he was as scared of us as we were. Wappingers Fall, New York. So, I spend a lot of time here in upstate New York, there are a ton of people that I have gotten to know, and they've led me to so many out-of-the-way places I would have never known otherwise. I've spent time on farms, in lakeside cabins. I've slept in communes with my hippie friends. I thought I had seen it all, but nothing prepared me for what was coming. One year, a little before Halloween, a friend had invited me to escape this city for a week, and to avoid the craziness of the season, clear my head. I was all about it. She told me that instead of staying with her on the commune, we would be heading into the woods, camping out with nothing but tents and the stars. 
I remember my mother complaining about me being out in the wild. What she called being with wildlife. But I figured that she just didn't understand. People from the city think there are wolves and mountain lions and bears everywhere when you walk into the woods. So I just packed my bag, kissed my mom goodbye, explaining that I have been to many places before. This would just be another interesting experience. I wasn't the only person my friend invited, which would help. The more people, the less likely wildlife would bother us, and they say that animals are more afraid of you than you are of them. I just wanted to enjoy my time away, without feeling neurotic. Being in a group of ten instead of two would help ensure that coyotes wouldn't just walk up to us. As the first night of the trip got going, there was guitar playing and dancing. People were gathering around the fire. Some were inebriated, some were not. Personally, I had a few glasses of champagne, but nothing crazy. The fire eventually began to die down, right around midnight, and all the tents in our little clearing between the trees began to fill up with tired hippies. I was getting ready to follow everybody to bed, but I had the urge to just somehow take advantage of the quiet time, sit alone by the dying fire, and enjoy the calm breeze that passed through. Everybody said goodnight as they walked by. Shortly after, I heard a rustling in the trees. I did not think much of it. I figured it was somebody who had wandered back from the woods. But when the rustling stopped and nobody emerged, I took my last sip of champagne and set my glass down. I looked towards the spot where the rustling was coming from, and still, no one. That's when I noticed two red dots a little ways into the trees. They were lined up like eyes, but I had never, in any of my travels, seen animals or people with eyes like that. I wanted to get a closer look. I took a few steps toward the trees. The clearing was coming to an end, and the shadows of the trees started covering me. This only made the red dots glow brighter. I looked up at the sky for a moment. There was not much light coming down, because the moon was waning. When I looked back down to the trees, the orbs were gone. I stood still for a moment. Maybe I was seeing things. I didn't usually drink, so I began blaming the champagne. Suddenly, I heard more rustling as the shadow behind me grew larger. I heard heavy breathing coming from behind, and then I felt something warm and wet drip onto my neck and down the back of my shirt. I froze and didn't dare turn around. I stood there, paralyzed for a few seconds. It looked like whatever was behind me was almost as tall as the tree next to me. I couldn't make out much from the shadow because of how dark it was. I could hear from its breathing that it did not sound human. I knew it was too big to be a wolf, so maybe a bear. I figured that a bear would not have stayed silent and would have mauled me by now. Something was very different about this creature. I heard grunting and saw from the shadow that it was moving slowly. I heard it walk away, its footsteps heavy on the ground. I was paralyzed by fear, but I wanted to know what it was and why it spared me. Surely, bears and mountain lions would just attack. Slowly, I turned my body in the direction of the footsteps. What I saw, I can never unsee. There was a large creature. It had to be eight feet tall, walking across to the clearing on its hind legs. It looked like an extremely large dog. A werewolf, maybe? But the moon was in full. I could make out the black fur in the dim lighting of the embers from the fire. I could see a tail, but I could also tell that the muscles of the creature 
or actually like a man's. Kind of like a bodybuilder. I stood there in awe as it walked by the tents, ignoring the people inside. I could see ears perched on top of its head, large and pointy, but since he was walking away, I never got to see his face. There was one point as I turned my body completely around that he seemed to stop. His hearing must have been fine-tuned. I stopped moving too. I didn't even breathe. I watched as he started walking again into the woods, the trees and bushes around him rustling. After a minute, I let myself breathe. When he disappeared, I ran to my tent that I was sharing with a friend and hid myself in my sleeping bag. I never told anybody what I saw. I figured they would think I was crazy. But it's true. I was sure I saw those eyes a few more times on that trip. But I never did see that same creature. At least not another time. I grew up in Adams, Massachusetts, a town below the highest point in the Berkshires. It is a mountain town, full of families, and all my friends lived close by. Right around the corner, actually. On the 4th of July, 2015, our town had all the parades and parties a family town could ask for. Fireworks were scheduled for the evening, and the smell of barbecue was everywhere. Delicious. I worked an ice cream shop in town, and, sucky, I had to work during the holiday, but it was fine with me. It would just mean extra money, and tips towards the car I really wanted to buy. My shift ended around 5 o'clock, and I had plans to skip my parents' and neighbor's shindig and go down to the cemetery with friends for some peace and quiet. All the screaming kids... Parade music that I'd been hearing the whole day was really starting to get to me. Not after hearing it all shift. I met up with everybody outside my house. We all got burgers before leaving. There were about five of us. We all started walking down to the cemetery, eating, chatting, and talking about the beautiful weather. The part of town where the cemetery was was in a much quieter part. It didn't even feel like we were in the same town. The cemetery wasn't huge at all, but it was big enough that we could find a quiet place to sit, hang out for a bit, and be completely unbothered. Once we were all settled under a tree, I relaxed, just listened while everybody else was talking over one another. I didn't really have much to say since I was still reeling from work and how busy the day was for me. I noticed right then, something moving in the distance behind a couple big mausoleums. It was dark, and I could only make out a shadow. I could not tell what I was looking at, but I figured an animal had come down from the mountainside, wandered into town after smelling all the food. Then I saw, whatever it was, sprint from behind one mausoleum to the next. It looked way too big to be a mountain lion, and too fast to be anything large like a bear. For a minute, it had me startled. I could not imagine any animal. There is no animal I can think of being out in the light of day. Not like this. Maybe it had rabies or something. Or mad cow disease, which made it crazy. Which in turn made me nervous. One of my friends noticed a change in the look on my face. Tapped me on the head and asked me what was wrong. I didn't want to say I saw a big, scary shadow running around the cemetery. I was sure they would make fun of me when they looked and saw nothing. So, I shrugged it off, said it was nothing, and that I was just so tired. My eyes were simply playing tricks on me. No big deal. I couldn't stop thinking about what I had seen. Right then, I saw the figure again. It sprinted back further into the cemetery, this time behind gravestones, and then behind a tree. My curiosity got the best of me at this point, so I played it off like I needed a walk and headed in the direction of the shadow. 
when I saw it take off again, I noticed it had an unbelievably large stature. I couldn't tell you how tall it was, but I knew it was bigger than any of us, and the quick glances that I got of it reminded me of a man completely covered in hair. I laughed to myself and kept walking. Imagine Bigfoot coming down from the woods. Obviously, that can never happen. Right? I approached the mausoleum that it had been hiding behind. I looked down to be sure not to trip and froze. There, in the dirt, was this enormous footprint, the size of my forearm, complete with claws, right there in the soil. I began to panic a little, puzzled by something I did not yet understand. I had never heard of a creature with a footprint so big in my life. I proceeded with caution towards the tree that it had ducked behind. I just needed to know if I was crazy, or if we were actually in danger sitting out there. I got to the tree and found nothing behind it, no one crouching or hiding from us. This is when a cluster of leaves fell from the tree above, hit me on their way down. I heard a loud rustling too. That was not the breeze. I slowly lifted my head to look up. There, glaring down at me was a hideous dog creature with eyes shaped like a human, but amber-colored and terrifyingly piercing. The dog creature was as long as the branch was, and he was laying on it. I could see drool dripping from his mouth, and he slowly began to growl. I've always read about a dog man existing somewhere, but like all other monsters, I never thought they were true, just like werewolves. But now, here I am, face to face with this monster. I could even feel his heavy breath, enveloping my face with his drool. I was afraid to move, at all, thinking any set of movements might trigger him to attack me. Just then, somebody outside the cemetery began lighting off fireworks. The sudden noise startled the creature and caused it to turn. I used that moment as an opportunity to run for my life. I ran back to my friends, told them we needed to go now. They protested at first, but then one of them caught a glimpse of the creature jumping down from the tree. She did not get a good look at it, only a shadow, but she could tell it was huge. We all grabbed our things and made our way out, quickly. The friend that had seen the shadow asked me what it was. I played it off saying I never saw a shadow. Only the signs of a coyote circling around and felt scared. I knew nobody would believe me anyway. But that's my one-time experience, seeing a real-life werewolf, or, as you would call it, a dogman. I know they exist especially up here in the Northeast. I lived in one of those rooming situations in a house on the side of a mountain out there in Colorado, not too far from Boulder, actually. We were only in a house in the surrounding few miles, and my roommates and I were all creatives in some way or another. There was a deck that actually overlooked the beautiful landscape we were by, full of trees, a few waterfalls. Painting is a huge hobby of mine, so I happen to find myself out there a lot, using the area as pure inspiration. One weekend, everybody had left, and I was all alone, the only one in the house. Everybody else had gone away to a retreat, and I decided to take the opportunity to work some of the bigger pieces that I wanted to finish, post online for sale, I spent most of the weekend out on deck, enjoying the crispness of the air, even though it was early spring, and winter would soon be left behind. I was taking full advantage of watching the trees sprout green little buds and leaves. It's incredibly peaceful. Nothing can quite prepare you for how amazing it really is. I would return to Colorado any day of the week. This was all until Sunday night, of course. Nobody was due home until Monday, so I decided to make Sunday a rest day. 
I did not go out on the deck at all, and I cuddled under a blanket in our huge living room, read some books. The day did drag on, but I was happy. Eventually, I fell asleep sometime after dinner, book in my lap. I was awakened a few hours later, when it was dark outside now. What awoke me was a very loud banging noise. In fact, it was extremely loud. I was a bit confused, being that I woke up in the dark by a loud noise. I began to set myself up. I didn't know where exactly the noise was coming from, so I waited to see if it would happen again. Sure enough, it did. It sounded like somebody was walking on the roof of our home. I began to get really scared. I was extremely far from help. Nobody would be home until the next morning. Luckily, we had cell service, so if I had to call the police, I could at least get in touch with somebody. I thought I should wait, though. Maybe it was something falling from a tree, or blowing in the wind. But my thoughts were interrupted by more banging on the roof. There was no way it was a tree. It had to be someone or something up there moving around. I tried to just stay calm, assume it was an animal, a squirrel maybe. Animals always sound bigger than they really are, and there's no way an animal could get in after all. Behind where I was sitting on the couch was the deck. The doors to it were just glass window panes, so you could see the beautiful view from inside. Next, I heard, as clear as day, whatever it was, jump from the roof onto the deck. Now, it could see me. I wanted to pick up my phone and dial 911. I didn't hear any more movement, so I assumed it was just standing there. I was afraid if I picked up my phone, it would come bursting through the door to stop me. I figured I should turn to see what it was before I jumped to any more conclusions. I turned my head to face the desk and stopped. I was completely startled by the figure that was staring at me right there through the glass. It was standing so close that his breath was fogging up the window. It had to be the size of the door itself, easily eight or nine feet. I couldn't even wrap my head around it. What was this thing that I was looking at? I was too busy noticing that this wasn't a person, but actually a dog standing on its hind legs. In the light of the minimal moon, I could see that it was baring its teeth at me and had a horrible looking smile on its face. The fur was in patches, black patches, with mangy parts of skin. I don't know what it wanted. It didn't move at all, even as I began to stand up. Its eyes, though, were what really bothered me, beyond anything else. I couldn't help but notice that these weren't exactly canine eyes. They were human-shaped and had a glow to them. This golden amber glow. It's never left me, and it never will. I moved across the room, and the eyes followed. The snout, I noticed, was short too, something that is not common in dogs, kind of like a bear, more up closer to the face, wider. So I backed up to the staircase and walked backwards up to my room, carrying my phone with me. I didn't take my eyes off this thing until it was out of sight. So I ran into my room, locked the door, I threw myself under a blanket and dialed 911, in hopes the blanket would hide me and conceal me. I told the operator there was a large animal on my deck. I described what I had seen. He asked me to kindly repeat myself, and sounded like he didn't believe me. After I described it, he asked if this was a prank call. Out of desperation, I cried out, begged him to believe me but he told me that it was probably just a wild animal that got lost on its way through the woods. He kindly asked me to go back down, check the deck to see if it was still there. If it was, 
he would send someone. I made my way out. Nothing in me wanted to go back down there and look. But I knew if I wanted help, it was the only way. As I started back down the stairs, I noticed that nothing was out on the deck. It was empty. This animal had vanished. So I hung up the phone without saying anything, headed towards the glass doors, hoping he wasn't hiding around. Whatever it was truly was gone. I popped on all the lights, made sure everything was locked up. I locked myself in my room, didn't come out until the next day when my roommates got home. It turns out that from the road, you can actually see a spot where this creature landed on the roof. The metal shingles were bent and clearly disfigured. When my roommates asked me if I had heard anything, I played dumb. I told them the night had been windy, but nothing out of the ordinary. It was then that I knew that what I saw was real and that I wasn't crazy. Now the real question is, what did I see? Back in the spring of 2006, when I was about 12 years old, my dad and I took a trip to Denver, Colorado to visit my grandmother. We were going to take a plane, but my dad figured it would be cooler to drive. This way we could enjoy the beautiful scenery and sights and sounds along the way, even stopping at points to get some fresh air. We lived in northern Nevada, so it was a long 15-hour ride to Denver. We packed the car and headed out on a weekend in early April. The ride was kind of boring at first. I spent most of my time playing Game Boy while my dad drove. We stopped at local restaurants, took some pictures, and even stopped for a bit at some hot sulfur springs. Once we got further into Colorado, dad took me on one of the more longer scenic routes. He went to Peak to Peak Highway, a road that is only a few miles north of Denver. The road is about 30, 40 miles long, something like that. We would check it out, then continue down to Denver afterwards. It was beautiful there. The trees, the mountain ranges, and the cool, crisp air. We'd gotten there a little late, and before we knew it, night had set in. The road is in the middle of the mountains, and does not have any lights. Dad had to rely on the headlights to see where we were going. It got pretty dark out there, and there weren't really any other cars off the slate on the highway. There were two or three that we passed when it was light out, but once it had gotten dark, we maybe saw none. My dad was pretty tired from the drive, and we did not have any signal on the radio. He asked me to talk to him to help keep him awake. I began asking him a bunch of random questions about Grandma and what it was like growing up. We talked for a bit, deep conversation, actually, when suddenly I thought I could make out a figure in the distance. I wasn't sure, though. As we came closer, I began to see something more visible. It was standing in the middle of the road, with its hand straight out in front of it, I yelled to my dad a bunch of times to stop. I was panicking, and finally, he braked. That's when we saw it. It wasn't a man, but a creature, with hairy hands and long fingernails. It was more like claws than fingernails. Incredibly tall, well over seven feet, and standing just like a human on two legs. It was pretty hairy, but not crazy hairy you could see its muscles beneath its fur. We could not make out a face. Its hands were still up in the way, protecting it from the light. But its legs had hawks like a dog, and they were long. It lowered its hand, and we saw that it had a face very similar to a wolf, with very striking yellow eyes. It began snarling at us like it was pissed. My dad and I were frozen at what we were seeing. We couldn't get our words out. This thing was sizing us up. Finally, it moved out of the way and took a few steps toward us. This snapped Dad out of it. 
he put the car in reverse. Well, he threw the car in reverse. It wasn't a kind way of doing it. After he got a bit of distance from it, he turned the car around, sped away in the direction we had come. Him and I were terrified. I asked Dad over and over what that was. He just kept responding, calm down, relax. But I began to freak out even more. Outside my dad's window, I could see it keeping up along with us, running right alongside our vehicle. We were speeding down the road, and this thing was keeping up with us, like it was nothing. I yelled, told dad that it was right there, go faster, faster. He refused to look over, and stayed focused on driving. He told me to grab the roof handle above my seat, to hold on, and put the pedal to the metal. Literally. I closed my eyes, began praying. We just drove and drove. I couldn't tell you how long. Finally, the car began to slow down. Dad told me to open my eyes. We hadn't realized that we had somehow lost the creature somewhere along the way. But it was gone. Nowhere to be seen. We reached Grandma's in the early morning. But my dad instructed me not to mention anything about what we had seen at all. The experience shook both of us pretty badly. My dad and I would only talk about it with each other, reading stories online, trying to figure out and play detective. What was it that we had seen? We debated if maybe we just saw a bear, but we both knew that made no sense, judging by what it looked like, and the speed this thing ran at, and two legs? It didn't make any sense. I know bears can walk on two legs for a short distance, but they're kind of klutzy. This thing, it was walking on two legs so natural, like a human being. I know for a fact bears don't look like that, and they don't have long legs with hawks on them like a dog. My father always reminded me not to mention this story to anybody, afraid that people might think we were both crazy, but I felt like I had to share this with you. We saw this dogman, and letting you know he exists might help you someday too, or somebody who hears this.